When all is said and done, the one month of home chem experiments will likely teach us all more than the past two decades of indoor air and surface chemistry research. And there is so much data, it's going to take months to go through. But while we were on site, the scientists were already able to draw some early conclusions about how chemicals are accumulating and transforming in our homes. So here's what we know so far. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. We have chemicals indoors that come from outdoors. We have chemicals indoors that originate indoors. Those chemicals can react with one another, making chemicals that weren't there to begin with. We know something about what's coming in. We know something about what's originating indoors. Those things that are being made, there's some real questions there. So when we think about the air we inhale, indoors or outdoors, it's important to think about the types of gas molecules that you're inhaling, but also the size of the particles that are present. It's important to go back to our chemistry lessons and remember that materials exist in different phases. So if you start with solids, they melt into liquids, and then those evaporate into gases. When we're talking about particulate matter, or PM, in science we actually refer to them as aerosols because the term can mean that these are little particles in the air or droplets. So they can be solid or liquid present in the air and the size of particles can vary greatly. So particles range from about one nanometer in size all the way up to 20 micrometers in size. That's 20,000 nanometers. So many orders of magnitude difference. And their size will dictate how long they hang around in the air. The bigger particles are heavier, so they're gonna fall back down to, to the ground very quickly. But then the smallest particles, they linger around much, much, much longer and they can travel deeper into your respiratory tract and might lead to long-term health effects that are still under investigation. Imagine you were keeping a house budget and imagine you had something like $400 a week that you knew was coming in and you had to figure out why at the end of the week that $400 was gone. Right now we can explain why 200 of that $400 is gone. And with home chem we're going to better understand why that additional $200 is disappearing every week. So chemists are originally alchemists, mm -hmm. right? So originally entirely dedicated to making gold. Out of anything they could find, urine, mercury, rocks, <laughs> they tried to create gold without actually understanding what gold was, that it was an element that, that one would have to mine. Eventually, they figured out that instead of just trying to make gold, you could ask questions and you could make other things. Make other things. Many other things. And many other things. Not and gold. you could have ideas and you could think about what the world is made of and then how could you change what things are made of. So chemists started to really try to think about how to make molecules that were useful. And if you fast forward until today, now we have chemicals everywhere. Everything is made of chemicals. We are made of chemicals. The wall behind us is made of chemicals. The we're air we're breathing, breathing chemicals. chemicals. I think what people really mean when they're trying to say chemical free is synthetic chemical free. So there's a big difference between say opening up a lemon and smelling that lemon or drinking its juice and then artificially make the compound called lemonine in a factory and then putting that in a product, right? Then you have a synthetic chemical versus the natural chemical that's coming from the, the lemon itself. And there are clear differences between taking that single compound that you made in a factory and if you open up a lemon and you smell it now versus three hours later, a lot of it has decayed and, and oxidized and changed. The smell of that lemon doesn't smell quite fresh. And that's because what you're really smelling is a myriad of chemicals that's coming from the lemon. One of them is lemonine. And just because something is natural doesn't mean it's inherently okay or good for us. Exactly. I think that's really important to remember. Most of these synthetic compounds that are widely used in clothing and in flooring were developed starting in the 1950s. And that's really when the field of chemistry came into its own. Turning them into products, Turning which them we into use products. today. Which, which are essential to our quality of life. Contractors that are in the homes and the homeowners both want to come up with accurate, consistent solutions that solve the problems. As the instrumentations get more precise, we learn more about them, we're uh, better able to develop tools, services to help the homeowner improve their indoor air quality. The indoor air quality is a big issue 
So if there's things that can be done to resolve indoor air qualities, it's really going to help us as an equipment manufacturer because it's not something that we can resolve. The whole idea of safer by design is right. a very modern concept, right? When you're developing a product, how about trying to study the potential unintended consequences of the product you're developing while you're developing it, instead of waiting a long time and then finding out that there were some issues with that product, having to recall it, develop something better and a substitute. So a good example is BPA, bisphenol A, which is in water bottles and it's very, very popular. And then some studies went and found, wait a minute, BPA can be bad for you. They're trying to figure out a way to substitute the BPA because you kind of need the BPA to make the plastics work. But what's that substitution going to be? And is it going to have other unintended consequences? Are there going to be similar health effects? So now you find all of these BPA-free bottles in the market. Just because they're BPA-free doesn't mean that they don't have any categories of phthalates. Or other chemicals. Or other chemicals that might be harmful to you. That is not what that means. It means that it's free of BPA. Nina, a lot of our viewers on YouTube are writing in and being like, lemons put out VOCs, that's crazy. VOCs are bad. How can a lemon be bad? Can you explain VOCs a little bit? Yeah, that's, that's important to talk about. VOCs are volatile organic compounds. If you smell anything, it's very, very likely to be a VOC. If you go out into a field of flowers, you're gonna be smelling VOCs that those flowers are emitting. And we humans also emit VOCs. Is this why my baby smells magical? Oh my gosh, yes. There's been a lot of curiosity in the scientific community to try to identify new baby smell. Yes, those are VOCs that you're smelling. And the same applies to, you know, older people. And as we age, there are some compounds that change that we're emitting from our breath and our skin. One of our students in the study mentioned that a uh, compound named non anel might be emitted at higher con concentrations as you get older and older. So we are always emitting VOCs and those might be changing over the course of your life as well. And so the adjective volatile is more because it reacts, not because it's like, gonna get you, right? Yeah, it's because it evaporates. That's really, really what it means. Something volatile is something that evaporates and then it's present in the air and then you can detect it with your nose. At home chem, we have found a couple of things that we expected, like we get more emissions from a propane stove than from a um, electric stove top, for example. But then we've also seen some things that we didn't expect, for example, the Toaster is a really significant source of particles. I just had no idea that toasters emitted lots of particles, and you don't really see that when you're making toast, but we, our instruments can sense that, all these tiny little particles that get emitted, and it's just like, what else in our home is emitting all of these small particles? Um, and another thing that I think is really like scary, I suppose, is that the concentrations of uh, aerosol particles inside are way higher than they are outside, and a lot of people associate air pollution with outside. In reality, it's all inside, and this is where we spend most of our time. Plug in the toaster, and you start making a piece of toast. You have that heating element right there, yep. and that starts warming up some I food call it debris. Food that debris, was hot. also some gunk. You know, we we need to mention oils that there are oils at every surface. Yep. There's no absolutely clean surface in your indoor environment ever, including the heating elements. So the second you turn it on, you start heating up all of those oils. And the same thing that happens when you're cooking and you're frying and you heat up the oil, it starts coming up into the air. Add to that the bread itself. It's gonna be emitting a bunch of different things. One thing that we found is that there's ethanol coming up. It's a byproduct of yeast. Microbes, they have a good time. They make some ethanol. And then if there's tiny pieces of bread that touch, that heating element, you know what happens. You see a little bit of smoke coming up. You can smell that your toaster might be burning a little. Maybe it's just all of those crumbs at the bottom of your toaster. Those are also making a lot of very small particles. So we're comparing particles that are 2.5 microns with particles that are 0.1 microns in diameter. So if you use the same instruments that you right. use to count PM 2.5, which was just weighing them, well then all of a sudden you can't really weigh those guys anymore. They're way too small. It's kind of like having a massive boulder, but just one of them, mm -hmm. and then 500 little tiny pebbles. All the masses in the boulder, they're so small, they kind of behave like gas molecules. They can float around for a very, very long time. So they're a lot more complicated to measure because they amount to no mass, but they, uh, they still matter in terms of health effects. Another villain in the house, in home chem, is our gas stove. Oh, that's right. So the gas stove, whenever, whenever you do combustion, 
just like the tailpipe of your car, mm -hmm. you release nitrogen oxides, NO and NO2 radicals. There's always nitrogen in the air. It's not really reactive. It doesn't affect our health in any way. It's, you know, it's just hanging out there. Totally benign. But then when you have an open flame, such as your gas stove, that flame can actually grab a little bit of that nitrogen from the air, the N2 that you have in the gas phase, and then react with oxygen that we also have in the air at high amounts, because we're inhaling it all the time, O2, and then they react together in the flame yes. and they form NO. And this is exactly the same chemistry that happens in lightning. Right? So yes. it's a huge amount of energy thrown into a system with benign nitrogen and generally benign and very healthy oxygen. And that okay. huge amount of energy, along with the light, along with the heat, helps have that chemical reaction and you make your NO. So let's start with our little NO radical. It comes out and the ozone comes in from your open window or maybe in for your ventilation system. Mm -hmm. And that ozone and the NO, they get together and they make an NO2. That NO2 radical is a little bit of an intermediate. Again, maybe not necessarily so bad. That NO2 radical is then going to go and find itself another supervillain, another ozone, right? So mm -hmm. NO2 plus ozone gives you the NO3 radical. The NO3 right. radical is like the Mondo supervillain. In the outdoor air, the nitrate radical, NO3, that's only around in significant concentrations at night. So for outdoor air quality, NO3 will be reacted away when the sun comes out, so it's a little bit like a vampire that comes out at night and starts attacking. And it will go and it will attach itself in, and then those molecules change forms. They're no longer just an organic molecule, they are now an organic nitrate. And organic nitrates form those secondary organic aerosol particles. So there Again, you go. more particles. More particles, growing the particles. And what seems to happen is when you grow particles, you can often grow them into that size range mm -hmm. that we know from other studies one can breathe in and end up deep have. into your lungs and then travels through your body and could affect your health in the long term. So, what we've been finding here at Home Chem is that when we cook, we emit gases and particles into the air and then we breathe those in. So for example, during Thanksgiving, we cook a turkey. And so you might think, well, I'm also going to eat the turkey, right? So what's the difference between eating it versus breathing it? Well, one of the differences is that the particles will deposit in your lungs. So a lot of the adverse health effects of air pollution cause you know, problems like pulmonary disease, for example, or cardiovascular disease. When you think about evolution and the way that our bodies you know, came to be the way they are today, our, our digestive system behaves very, very differently from our respiratory system. Think about coffee, for example. We are used to getting a cup of coffee, and then if we drink the coffee, it's going through your system, and your body has ways of dealing with things that are a little bit more toxic versus a little bit less toxic. It chooses what you're going to use you know for energy for your body and the vitamins and then everything else that is probably not good for your body it gets rid of your lungs are not trained to do that in the same way yeah and if you live near a coffee roaster it turns out that the caffeine in the coffee actually gets into particles and air pollution and you can breathe the caffeine you can breathe the uh, caffeine quite a quite a ways away so it brings up the question of less developed countries looking at indoor air quality in places with very poor ventilation and very inefficient cooking methods, such as various cook stoves, you know, you wonder um, what the exposure is there versus here. I think it's really important also to realize that we talk a lot about a few favorite molecules. So we worry about formaldehyde and we worry about carbon monoxide yes. indoors. And we know that there are some health effects of those, but those are really just markers. They tell us that there's other chemistry happening. Mm -hmm. And you never just get formaldehyde inside a home. It's gonna come along with a whole suite of other organic molecules. It's important to know indicators of air pollution inside your home, but it's also important to realize that that comes with complexity. That just because you're worried about formaldehyde in your home, carbon monoxide in your home, or particles in your home, it doesn't mean that those are the only things that could potentially affect your quality of life, that could potentially affect the quality of, of the air inside your home. It just means that from a science standpoint and from a practitioner standpoint, you can't just go out there with a mass spectrometer and measure everything that you have inside your home, right? So there are different levels of knowledge that are needed in different situations. So if you want to have an air quality monitor inside your home, it might be giving you an overall idea of what's happening. But from a science standpoint, 
there are still many, many questions that need to be answered on the subsequent chemical reactions that happen after you introduce things in your home. And we can also just say, um, not to be scared of the complexity, right? Yes. Inside the yes. home is an incredibly complex environment. We're mm -hmm. seeing so many molecules. It's not just carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and particulate matter. Mm -hmm. It is also thousands and thousands of different organic molecules that we could spend days just drawing on the board. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you walk into a field of flowers and you smell <laughs> all of those beautiful fragrances, that comes from a myriad of different VOCs. And so the same thing is happening inside the house. There are some chemicals that last a really, really long time. So a lot of these chemicals that we're talking about, limonene being one of them, that, that really strong lemon scent, mm -hmm. that disappears very quickly because it's so reactive. It reacts with ozone in the air and radicals in the air. And then there's a class of molecules and chemicals like phthalates. And phthalates are really different. They don't react with, with very much at all, if anything. They just stay with their original structure. They ozone can come along, and they're just not going to care. They don't react. They they're, just they stay. They linger around. So they're also very sticky, which means that they like surfaces a lot. So in in indoor environment and a lot of built environments, especially in the United States, we have a lot of vinyl flooring. So vinyl flooring has one of its you know ingredients that's made to fabricate them is DEHP, which is a phthalate. Um, that's put in very, very high amounts. From a science standpoint, it's percent yes. concentrations, huge which amounts. for us is huge, huge amounts. And it's used as a plasticizer so that you can make better tiles that actually are flexible. Um, so you really need them for the fabrication process. And then we have all of these really old buildings, you know, decades old that have vinyl floorings, right? Especially schools and hospitals and commercial facilities that have vinyl floorings everywhere. Some homes have vinyl floorings, especially in your kitchen, your bathroom, and those all have phthalates in them. So why should you care if the building is like 30, 40 years old? Because those phthalates have just been accumulating on the floor and they get into the dust and they just, and they're constantly coming out of the flooring yeah. and just accumulating. And the problem with them is that you can sweep them away, you can mop up all you want, they're gonna, it's still, still coming gonna out. come out. Because remember, when you first got your vinyl flooring, the brand new vinyl flooring, it had such high amounts of phthalates. And it doesn't matter if you try to make your environment warmer, to try to make them come out a little faster, they're always leaking forever, essentially. And there are some molecules that live in, the, in particles in the outdoor environment, and they're very rarely found in the gas phase. And phthalates are one example of those. Mm -hmm. But concentrations are so high inside of phthalates that we think that some of those molecules may actually still exist in the gas phase. So you have these compounds that have completely different chemistries inside than outside. Yeah. They're, they're just always going to be there. We're just gonna move them around from place to place. Yeah. So they can come off of your vinyl flooring, they can come into the particles that are in the air when you're cooking, and then maybe those particles left the room. But remember, they're still coming off of the vinyl flooring tomorrow after you're done cooking. And then maybe they'll come off of the vinyl flooring and then they're gonna glue onto the walls or they're gonna glue onto your sheets and your or bedding. Or maybe you're going to or your inhale lungs. them or ingest them. And they're not, your body's not gonna be able to process them necessarily. Yeah. So phthalates are known as an endocrine disruptor, so they can affect the way your body balances your hormones, so they can affect health in a way that is not really gonna lead to death, it's not a very serious health effect, but it's one of those quality of life issues that could affect populations, it could affect uh, your unborn child, it could affect you over the course of a very long time and the way that you regulate your hormones. They sit in a class of, of chemicals that we just don't know much about. We just don't know what they're going to do in the long term and we don't know what their health effects are. So the first step to understanding that is to really ask, what are they doing in the home? Mm -hmm. How do they get there? And then where do they move? Do they move from the surface into dust? Or do they just go into those really tiny particles that, mm -hmm. we that we're in? inhaling? Are they ending up in the walls over a long period of time? Yeah. Do they come back off of the walls when the ventilation conditions change? What or happens? when the temperature goes up? So we're trying to explore a few of those with home chem and really trying to understand mm -hmm. some of these man-made synthetic compounds 
and, and think about their, their chemistry inside our house. So I guess what's been the most shocking to me during home chem is just the sheer amount of particles and volatile organic compounds we have in our homes. This is not super surprising. We understand that indoor air quality can be a lot worse than outdoor air quality if you're cooking or cleaning, but it really surprised me how long that lingers in the indoor environment and how that can lead to subsequent transformations. That means that if you use a chlorine-based cleaner like bleach to clean the floors, that is going to react with things on the floor, you know, the, the dirt that you're trying to clean off. Well, it's reacting with that, and then something else gets released into the air, which reacts with something else, which leads to another reaction. And those, you know, the amount of reactions that are occurring has really surprised us. And that's gonna take, I guess, months of data analysis to really understand all of those chemical pathways, but it's already been surprising us from the start. If we were to choose a hero for the indoor environment, it would probably be your fume hood. Or and your ventilation, and your ventilation system. system. Depending on where you live, you may want to seal your house from the outdoor air because the outdoor air might be so polluted. But then when you cook or you're clean, then all of a sudden that reality is flipped and the inside of your home is much more polluted than the outside. And there are other heroes that are yet to be found. For example, we know that surfaces play a huge role in the chemistry of the indoor environment. So is it possible that maybe wiping your surface is gonna help with that chemistry? So surfaces inside buildings are really important. If you look at the indoor atmosphere, the, the air inside of buildings, what we call the surface to volume ratio, the total area of the surfaces normalized by the volume of the indoor environment tends to be anywhere from 300 to 1,000 times higher than it is outdoors. So from an air pollution standpoint, as, as soon as pollutants move indoors or are released indoors, all the surfaces that those pollutants see are really important. Harmful chemicals and particles will uh, interact with surfaces, they may chemically react with surfaces, they'll deposit on surfaces, they may stick to surfaces and come off later on, a week later, a day later, an hour later. Surface chemistry is really important when you look at all the different surfaces, carpet fibers and walls and ceiling and blankets and even our own clothing and our own skin are important surfaces. And it turns out that we know a lot about ozone chemistry. We don't know everything we should know, but we know a lot more about ozone chemistry with surfaces than any other pollutants. And we know that ozone will chemically react with certain indoor materials much more effectively, much more efficiently, if you will, than it will with other indoor materials. So it reacts with carpet and paint, say, a lot more than it does with glass windows. But when ozone chemically reacts with most materials indoors, it forms byproducts, it forms new chemicals. The ozone might be consumed, which is a good thing, because ozone's bad for you, but in the process we might form a whole bunch of new things. And it turns out that there are certain materials that are great at chemically reacting with ozone and making ozone go away that don't form anything new, that essentially just decompose ozone without any bad byproducts. And my team has been spent probably the last seven or eight years studying those kinds of materials. They tend to be inorganic materials, things like limestone, things like volcanic perlite ceiling tiles. Um, and we're really high on clay-based plasters and paints. It turns out that what we found is that certain clay-based plasters and paints are amazing at removing ozone. They're very reactive with ozone. Ozone reacts with some of the minerals in the clay and it just decomposes the ozone and there's no byproducts formed. The clay also has these wonderful properties of taking up organic acids that are in the air, um, acids that can degrade things or cause irritation of the upper respiratory system, great at removing those from the air, and can also serve, if there's enough of it inside of a building, as a moisture buffer. So I, I learned five years ago or so after we started our research on clay, that museums in uh, Denmark, uh, perhaps in other places in Scandinavia as well, use false walls. They stack up unfired clay bricks to preserve works of art from ozone reactions and reactions with um, these organic acids that I mentioned that clay is so effective at removing. So they've been doing it apparently for a long time. It has these magic properties and we've actually done human subject tests where we'll expose human subjects that are trained. Uh, we've done this in Denmark that are trained 
to assess the quality of the air that they're breathing and they don't know where the air is coming from or what it's been treated with and we'll put new carpet in the airstream coming into the chambers or we'll inject ozone into the airstream coming into the chambers or we'll put clay on gypsum board coming into the chambers or, and even combinations of those things and everybody in our study and we published this in the panelists in the study said the air feels cleaner when we breathe it when it's been passed over a bed of clay.